Protectors of the Suna Suna Baba Protectors of the Suna Ina Alhamduli La Wasalat Wasalam Allah Wad Rasulallah Welcome to the Ask Sister Layla live Q&A show. This is the show. This is your chance where you can call in and ask your questions about Islam. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, what part of the world you're in. Uh, there's our uh, number. There's the call in information. And just to let everybody know, I'm getting ready to log in now on uh, YouTube. I mean, Facebook. We are live here on YouTube to take in your questions. We are also live on Facebook. I just set that up to see your questions and you can join our Zoom room and we're live on Twitter too. So any questions that you guys have about anything related to Islam, it could be about fasting, women issues, anything, even you brothers, you know, you can call the number on the screen. Call the number that's on the screen and inshallah, I will uh, answer your questions. So remember guys, Ramadan is right around the corner. We've just spent our time in our previous class discussing how all of us are obligated to fast unless we fall in one of those categories. So Questions about fasting? This is the time to bring them on too. So let's see. I'm logging in here. Okay, I got this going. The phone lines are open. Let me check my what app too. I got the what app going. Let me look, turn this up too. All right. So we're officially on the air. We're officially live for any of your questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I did it again. Facebook. I'm getting ready to share y'all to y'all groups now. Hold on. Y'all have to keep reminding me to do this. Y'all hear the clicks? That's me joining these different groups they got me in. Okay, so now we're live officially on Facebook, right? All the groups. Any questions about Islam? Feel free to call them in and ask them. Let's look at the Zoom room right now. Do we have any questions here in the Zoom room? I like to always start off with the Zoom people. What if you, okay, here's a question coming in already from Facebook. Uh, one of the sisters here wants to know, she said, what if you did not know that you only had a year to make up the fast from last year's Ramadan? And she's saying she just found out from attending my class and she has more days to make up than what is left. So she wants to know, what do you do in a case like that? And by the way, this is a good question. I want you sisters to understand that Allah's mercy supersedes his wrath. Allah doesn't hold us accountable for what we really did not know. Okay, so what you do is this, just make up the days that you can make up now that's left and then repent. Ask Allah to forgive you for not knowing that it was an obligation to make up those other days that you only had a year, okay? So I want you guys to know the fast is like the prayer. Just like we cannot make up any past prayers that we missed, we cannot make up any days of Ramadan that we missed either. So what you do in this case, sister, is just fast the days that's left 
and just ask a lot to forgive you for not knowing that you only had a year. And Allah will, inshallah, forgive you for that because he knows that you didn't know and he knows that, inshallah, it's your intention to do it from now on. See how forgiving our Lord is. I don't want any of you Muslims to lose hope. We have to have hope of the mercy of Allah. Okay, and let's look at here. I'm going to switch to the camera here. I see I got questions coming in from YouTube. Uh, we have a sister here in YouTube. Let me see if I can show her question here. Bam. Can you guys see it? Everybody on Facebook and Twitter. She says, if a Muslim sister father who Muslim let his daughter marry a man that's not Muslim, will Allah hold him accountable too? Of course. Allah holds us accountable for any for any and everything that we do, guys, it's haram. And this is a big innovation that's going on. This is a sacrilege in Islam. You know, a Muslim woman cannot marry a Kafir man. Do you guys understand that? A Muslim woman cannot marry a Kafir man, period, dot. And for a Muslim man to fall short of that, Oh, this is a big sin because he's the guardian over her. Oh, he's going to be punished, not just in this world, but he's going to be punished in the hereafter for that too. And by the way, that marriage is not valid. If a woman is married to a Kafir man, you, you're just an adulterer. That marriage is not valid in Islam. Does everybody understand that? It's not even a valid marriage. So yeah, he's held accountable for that. He's going to have to pay for all of that. Okay. And also, uh, we have to understand too, guys. Allah makes the laws because he knows his creation better than the creation knows itself. Women. We were created to follow the man, not to lead him. The purpose of marriage, your husband, your husband's job is to lead you and the children to paradise. How can a Kafir man lead you to anywhere but hell? So yes, this is a, a terrible thing to have happened. And yes, he's held accountable for that. Okay, let's see what other questions uh, we had here. Uh, we had some more. Let me move this thing. Okay, here's another question. I'm trying to share it so everybody can see. A sister wants to know what she should do if she passes gas accidentally while praying? Do, does she make up the prayer or what? MashaAllah, this is a very good question. One of the few things that will break your wudu is passing gas. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us what to do in those situations. He says, if you hear it or you smell it, your wudu is broken. So you leave the prayer and you have to go back and make a fresh wudu and you have to repray that prayer over because the prayer doesn't count. The prayer was invalid. So let her know that if she, even if it's an accident, if you smell it or hear it, the prayer is over. You have to go and make that prayer over again and make a fresh wudu first. So that's another very good question. This is why I like the Islam Q&A too, because we get some really good questions here that are serve as great reminders uh, for the Muslims all over the world. Okay, so even if she wasn't praying, passing gas breaks your wudu. So you have to go make a fresh wudu too. MashaAllah. And here's another question. Another sister says, my father passed away. Can my 26-year-old Muslim son be my guardian for marriage? And what is the benefits of doing Umrah over Hajj? 
Okay, let's answer the first question first. Uh, can your son be your guardian? Yes, he can, long as he's Muslim. Long as he's Muslim and he's puberty. So he's 26. Yes, and uh, he's closely related to you. That unconditional love is there. That yes, he can be your guardian. Uh, you don't have any brothers or uncles? I have to ask that question. Because if the father has died, you know, your uncles uh, can be your guardian or your brothers. Okay. Do you have uncles and brothers, first of all? Because I'm going to tell you why I'm asking this. Big problem in the Bantu community. Big problem in the Bantu community. Big problem in the Somali Bantu community. The women in that community seem to think that they can fire their guardians because your guardian told you no. You want to, you think you can replace them with someone else. That's why we have to have hikmah when it comes to answering these questions. Your father's dead, but where's your uncles? Where's your 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 um your brothers? They got rights over you before your son do. Hello. Is it a situation where your father's dead, but your uncles told you that you can't marry some loser off the internet and you don't want to listen to your uncles and you don't want to listen to your brothers. So you're going to tell your son to be your guardian. See, we got to get deeper than that. So to answer your question, uh, a, a son can be a guardian, but that's if you ain't got no uncles. That's if you don't have any brothers. If you have brothers and uncles, I'm sorry, sister, they trump your son. So I got to be able to read between the lines there. You can't fire your uncle. The prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said the uncle is like the father. So if your father's deceased, your uncles are your guardians. The uncle is like the father. So if your uncle is your guardian, your son cannot replace them. He doesn't become your guardian unless you have no one else. And if you are a band too, you got a bunch of uncles, sweetheart. So you do what your uncles tell you to do and stop talking to these men. Hello. Got to read between the lines. I want you women to remember that hadith. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the uncle is like the father. The uncle is like the father. So if your father is dead, your uncles are your guardians. And you cannot get replace your uncle with your son. Just like you couldn't replace your father with your son. The uncle gets the same respect in Islam. And the uncle has the same rights in Islam as the father had. Do y'all get understand that? So your dad is no longer here. His brothers are your guardians. Not your son. Hello? They can't be replaced. Okay, so be careful. And for you male dyer out there, when these sisters come to y'all asking y'all those type of questions, y'all got to do just like I did. Be able to read in between the lines because remember, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said if anyone could outsmart shaitan, it would be a woman. And women are in love with the idea of love. A woman will sell her own daddy out to be with some man that she don't know nothing about because she thinks she in love. So you got to be able to read between the lines when y'all answer these questions. Because if these women come from the uh, Africa, they, they were born Muslim and they got a million Muslim relatives. You got to be able to read. These ain't no converts we talking about. Okay. So be careful. Let's look at the next question here. Hold on, guys. Uh, I'm trying to copy paste. Wait a minute, hold on. Okay, in regards to if the sister is um, 
doesn't have uncles. Okay. Her son is only if she has no brothers that are Muslim. If her father's deceased, her uncles become her guardian. If she ain't got no uncles, then her brothers become her guardian. If she ain't got no brothers, then her son. That's how it rolls in Islam. Her son is a last resort. You guys, guys got that? All right. Okay. Okay. So now um, it would be really great if I could have someone reading the questions to me because I was able to see them, but um, I'm flipping this, the uh, computer screen to do this. It's kind of confusing for me. I don't know where I'm at on this, which who, who, if I'm looking at YouTube or if I'm looking at Facebook right now, uh, where am I at? Okay. Uh, hold on. Let me put this back. There I am. Okay. All right. So let's, let me flip to YouTube, uh, Zoom. Okay, would somebody like to take the mic and Zoom and read the questions to me that's here? And if you're on uh, YouTube, you can read their questions too. Whoever's logged in on Zoom, if you're logged in on YouTube, you can read their questions to me too. That's easier than me flipping, looking to see which, which camera I'm in. Okay, go ahead. I'll just read it. Um, it says, if a Muslim sister's father who is a Muslim let her let his daughter marry a man that's not a Muslim. Will Allah hold the dad accountable on the day of judgment? Okay, I answered that one. I see you're catching up on them. Yeah, I answered that one. Of course, this is haram. That's not a valid marriage anyway. Like I said, that marriage is not even valid because it's haram. A Muslim woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man. This is zina. Your marriage is not accepted. You are committing zina. And yes, that father has a heck of a sin to pay for, uh, to answer to. Yes, go ahead. Next, uh, Samira, go ahead. Did you answer the other question about what is the benefit of Umrah over Hajj? Okay, Umrah is the little Hajj. We make Umrah before we make the Hajj. Umrah is the same benefit as Hajj. It's just the little Hajj. So what are the benefits of Umrah? The same as Hajj. But it's the little Hajj. You make Umrah first and then you make Hajj afterwards. Usually when y'all go to make Hajj, your package will include that. Your package will include Umrah and Hajj together. The Umrah is easier than the Hajj. It's easier. I would go back and do Umrah, but I probably would never make Hajj again. Because with Umrah, you don't have to do all those tawafs and all those sighs and stuff which are very tiring and bad on your knees and stuff. So Umrah is easier, but as far as the reward, it's the same as Hajj. Okay, next question, go ahead. Another sister wants to know if her period comes before Asr, does she make the Asr prayer when her period is over? Um, what does she do if her period, if her cycle comes during a time period of her cycle? Okay, if your period comes, yeah, I answered this last week or two weeks ago. You don't worry, you make that prayer after your period is over. When your gusa, when your menses ends, whatever prayer that 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 it that it came in, you just make it then. That's it. That's all you do. Nothing else. No rituals, no holy moms, none of that. Just if your period came during Asr, then you know you can't pray now, of course. But when your period is over, you take a gusso, you make that asa prayer. That's all. That's it. That's all you do. Just that's all it is. Is it understandable? I answered that a couple of weeks ago. Just make whatever uh, prayer was in and that's it. Okay. Next question. Go ahead. Uh, could I, I was just going to ask something following up the question just answered. Um, you, if you're making up, does it have to be uh, another asr or it could be any time of the day when you're making up for the the asr that you said you missed when you make up? For whenever it? your period, like I said, whenever your period is over, you take a gusso and you make it. 
immediately. Just like when you over, when you miss a prayer due to sleep, you get up and you, uh, you make that prayer, don't matter what time of day that is. So it's the same because the law doesn't hold us accountable for what happens when we sleep and what happens like that with the menses. So it don't matter what prayer is in. You get up and make that when you when your menses is over, you take a gustle and pray. It don't matter what time of day it is. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, just like you would if you woke up from sleep. Okay. Yes. Another question is, can we eat KFC Burger King in the United States? Okay, this is a question that comes up. Because we have these rigid imams here in America. This is a, we're living in the days of fitna. And like I said, the prophet said that the sunnah will become abandoned, which means the hadiths. Instead of people telling us what the prophet said, instead of people saying what the companion said, they'll be talking about what their imams say. Also, the Quran will disappear. What does that mean? That means understanding of it will disappear. Well, we're living in those days here in America. Welcome to the world. No one can change the laws of Allah. Allah says clearly in the Quran, lawful for you is the food of the people of the book and their women in marriage. That's clear. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you, you can eat the meat of the people of the book. That's clear. And when they ask, well, what about if we don't know how they killed it? Or if they even said, Bismillah, the Prophet said, you say Bismillah and eat it. After the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, this same idiotic debate was going on with the, during the time of the companions. You know, different people, as Islam spread throughout the Roman Empire, the Romans were Christians. They converted to Islam. Syria was a Christian country. It became a Muslim country, okay? People were saying, you know, they slaughtered these sheep. They slaughtered these sheep and didn't mention Allah's name. And the companions kept telling them over and over again, their meat is lawful. Their meat is lawful. Are they not people of the book? Are they not people of the book? Umar had to keep telling the people that when he was the caliph, are they not people of the book? Abu Bakr told them, are they not people of the book? Ibn Abbas told them, Ibn Umar, Ibn Ma are they not people of the book? Well, Layla Nasheba is following in their footsteps. Are they not people of the book? Is America not a Judeo-Christian society? Yes, it is. So America is a Judeo-Christian society. So according to Allah, the creator and his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those companions who were the best of this nation, are they not people of the book? You can eat their meat, period, dot. And you brothers out there, Y'all got to stop making this religion hard because you got a problem with it. You cannot issue uh, Islamic verdicts that contradict what Allah said in those companions. It used to tick off the companions and it ticks off people like me. The traditional Muslims. What's a traditional Muslim? A traditional Muslim is a Muslim that sticks with the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions and those first four caliphs. Y'all need to come back to that way too. Stop telling the Muslims in America that they can't eat from McDonald's. All the meat in America, I don't care where it's killed at here. If these are, this is a, the people of the book. Their meat is lawful in America. 
They don't have to say Bismillah over it. They don't even have to kill slaughter like us. Like the prophet said, our fika rules are for us. Our fika regulation is to slaughter with that by uh, that certain way. That's not their regulation. But we can still eat their meat. You say Bismillah and eat it, people. Islam is easy. Stop making it hard on the people with these crazy fatwas y'all delivering that oppose what the prophet said, that oppose what those companions said, just like y'all doing with this Ramadan every year. It's getting ready to happen. You're going to see these crazy Muslims here in America talking about if you want to look for a local sighting, you can. When it's not, you don't have the choice to look for no local sighting. The prophet said any Muslim who's reliable and trustworthy from any part of this world who has seen the moon has seen it for us all. It ain't no choice. Stop deviating away from the true Islam to appease the people and yourself. So yes, we can eat their meat from McDonald's. It's the people of the book. Next question. And I gave my Dalil. Next question. At what age should a woman stop breastfeeding her child? This is another good question. I get this a lot. Uh, the Allah tells us in the Quran that the breastfeeding time is two years, up to two years, up to two years. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was clear in the authentic hadiths too. A woman can suckle up to two years. So you can suckle your children up to two years, two years. I would, but you know, that doesn't mean that you have to, by the way, a lot of women will look at those hadiths and think that they have to nurse them. Oh no. I mean, that's the maximum. But if you want to get your kid off your breast and put it on a bottle so it can go to daycare so you can go to school or go to work, then that's nothing wrong with that. I had my daughter drinking out of a cup when she was eight months. Latifa tell you, I didn't have time for all that driving back and forth to help me nurse her. I had her behind drinking out of a cup at eight months and I had her in daycare because daycare wouldn't take them unless they could drink out of a cup. <laughs> so you don't have to nurse them that whole time. Okay. But that's the max two years. Does that answer the question? I hope that's clear because <laughs> I know these daycare centers, guys, I don't know some of them, they want the kid to be uh, off the, um, the, uh, the, the, you know, be able to drink out of a cup. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Go ahead there and hit them. When a woman inflicts with prolonged bleeding of her period for more than 20 days, um, can she just make up those days after Ramadan or should she take medications to stop her prolonged bleeding? Okay, hold on. I was working the camera to put y'all chats up so that people on faith, I can't read it. When I put your chat up on the screen, I still, I'm, that's why I'm maybe only reading for me, but I'm going to let it, leave it open so y'all can see it. Um, let me see. Let me hit this button for Sarah. This was what Sarah typed. Y'all see it there? but I'm going to keep this side open like this so y'all can see it. And that was her question. When a woman inf inflicts, when a woman is inflicted with prolonged bleeding of her period, like 20 more days. <clears throat> okay. Let me talk about Istahada. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Too many men have been trying to tell you women what istahada is, and I'm sorry they told you wrong. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was approached uh, with this question by one of his wives, Zainab, because Zainab suffered with prolonged bleeding. What is istahada? Istahada is prolonged bleeding. What does that mean? That means a woman starts her period and it doesn't stop. 
You've been bleeding for 30 days, 40 days. Oh, God forbid y'all don't let it go longer than that. Okay? Now, Zainab's case was a little different. Zainab liked to pray at night, guys. Remember I told you guys, if Shaitan cannot get you, he will try to get your wives or children. Well, Shaitan didn't like the fact that Zainab liked to pray at night. Okay, so to try to keep her from praying, she went through what's called istahada. So she told her husband, she said, my period just won't stop. And he told her, this is from Shaitan because he knew. Okay, Allah let him know that this is from Shaitan trying to mess with your wife. So the prophet told her in her case, you know, calculate. What would be her normal days of bleeding? Okay, and don't pray or fast during those days. And then for the other days, you know, uh, she can put a thing on, a, 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 like a Kotex on and, and, uh, and wash herself up and, and pray. But he went on to say, when a woman experiences prolonged bleeding, it's from a broken vein. What does that mean? That means if you sisters are bleeding nonstop, that's a sign from a law that something's wrong with you. It could be fibroids. It could be a form of cancer. It could be anything. So what do you do? You go to a doctor, get it checked out. Do you guys know that there's a lot of Muslim women here in America who have had cease, who've had um, hysterectomies because they had the warning signs of cancer and they ignored them because they were told by some idiot that it's istahada. It's not istahada. Prolonged bleeding is a sign that something's wrong with your body. You go to the doctor, women, and get it checked out. Do you understand? Do you sisters understand? This is important. Otherwise, you'll be like a lot of these women I know down there in Texas. I know a lot of sisters in Texas who had to have hysterectomies because they ignored it. They were told by their imams down there, oh, it's just, it's the heart of my sister. Just put a thing on. Uh, no, it was a sign of cancer, fibroids, ovarian cancer, all kind of stuff we women can get down there. Okay, so if your period lasts more than 14 days, you need to go see a doctor. Also, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said a woman's menses is not determined by the amount of days that she bleeds. Some women bleed for one day. Some bleed for two days. I used to bleed for 14 days, guys, because I had fibroids, okay? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said for the woman to look at the color of the blood. If the blood is black, if the blood is brown, if the blood is red, if the blood is pink, if the blood is yellow, you are on your period. That's a menses. And you don't fast nor pray until it stops. When you stick a piece of tissue up you and it comes out clear with no color, that's when your, blood, your period is over. So women bleed different amount of days. Some of you will say, oh, shake so-and-so said seven days. No, shake so-and-so ain't no man. I mean, ain't no woman. He's a man. The prophet Muhammad was clear. He said a woman's period is not determined by the amount of days. It's the color of the blood. My periods never lasted less than 14 days when I was young. When I started bleeding for a month, that's when I knew something was wrong. And that's when I went to the doctor. So if you go past 14 days, women, I strongly encourage you to get to a, a gynecologist because it's a sign like it was for me. 
that them fibroids done grew all over the place. With my case, it was the fibroids all over the place. I had to have surgery. For you, it could be anything, ovarian problems, uterine problems, anything. Get to a doctor. But you still don't pray. You still don't fast because that's a menses. Y'all understand? So now let's get to the question. Her question was, let me look at it again. I had to explain what a menses is to you. Now that I explained that, according to the sooner, y'all see how I answered. I didn't tell you what shake come a dime a dozen's opinion was. I didn't tell you what Imam Akhmi said. I didn't tell you what opinion Imam Shafi had. I told you what the prophet said. And I told you what happened with his wife. That's how we answer questions in Islam, brothers. Okay. All right. So let's look at the question again as she was asking me. She said, um, when a woman is uh, bleeding more than 20 days, she can't fast. So just make those days up after Ramadan. Yes, you make those days up after Ramadan, however many days it is. Do your best and make them up after Ramadan. Okay. Uh, can she take medication to stop her bleeding? Now that's a question I don't understand. If your doctor has, has, uh, evaluated you as having some type of sickness down there and he's giving you medicine or a DNC. Sometimes they issue a DNC for that stuff too. I don't know. You got to see your doctor about that. But if you're asking me, can you take these pills that a lot of women take to not have a period? No. Number one, taking those pills have been proven to make matters worse for you. Number two, this goes against the nature of how Allah created us women. We have periods. The prophet's wives didn't take no pills to stop their periods, you know? Why would you want to get, interfere with nature? Okay. So you just have to make those days up, sisters, if you can. Do the best you can. But what if you can't make those days up? You try. You got a whole year. You got a whole year to make them up. Okay. Or also you can do like the other sister that asked the question earlier. She doesn't have enough days left. I mean, there's not enough days left for her to make up last year. Well, do this. Cook a big pot of food and take it to the mosque on a Friday and feed the people after Juma. You know, Allah loves for us to seek forgiveness and follow it up with a good deed. So for the sister that asked the question about what if there's not enough days left to make up because she didn't know. You make up these days that are left and cook a big pot of food. Take it to the mosque on the weekends and say for all the single brothers, I'm going to let the imam know I'm cooking a big pot of spaghetti and some cornbread and I'm going to bring it to the mosque on Friday or Saturday for all the single people to eat. You know, this is a good deed. This is feeding people. This is a good deed that'll make up for that sin. And the same with you sisters that have to make up those days. If making up those days is a hardship for you, do the best you can and then cook some food and take it to the mosque on Friday or on Saturday to feed the, the single brothers, the single women, the children and that thing. See how easy the religion is. There was a man that came to the prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he had, and, and, and he, he had committed a sin and the prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him the expiation was to give in charity. The man said, I don't have no money to give. I'm poor. The prophet gave him some dates and say, here, here's some dates. Go pass them out to the people. See how easy the religion is. Okay, so for you sisters that are having a hard time making up those days by fasting, do the best you can and then cook some food. Take it to the mosque. Feed the sisters and brothers at the mosque. Allah is merciful. Okay, does that answer that question? 
Did I answer that question well? No other uh, uh, answers. But stay away from that medication. Unless it's a medication. Unless it's a medication that your doctor has given you for to help you with that prolonged bleeding. You guys got that call, Maylion? Did y'all get it? Did y'all get that call? I guess they did. I hope she's at home to get the calls. Okay, any other questions? Go ahead. Okay, good. Any other questions? Oh, wait yes, a minute. Um, yeah, go ahead. On YouTube, someone wants to know, if a woman is six months pregnant, can she fast Ramadan? She wants to fast if she can. If not, does she make up the fast later or pay a ransom? What if she starts the fast, then breaks it before time? Okay, let me start off with this question with the first part. This is another thing that ticks me off. There's a lot of people giving lectures on the fika of fasting. And they're telling you guys information that's based on a method or based on a fatwa instead of based on what the prophet said, what the companion said. I want every pregnant woman listening to me to understand you are obligated to fast. You have to fast. It's not a choice. Pregnant women are obligated to fast too, unless your doctor, your Muslim doctor has listed you as a high risk pregnancy. This is based on Ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar, and Ibn Masood. The original companions, the first scholars of Islam, they were here before the four Imams. They were here before Ibn Taymiyyah. They were here before Sheikh El Bani. They were here before Layla, Sheikh Morsi. Ibn Abbas and Ibn Umar and Ibn Masood, they all said that when Allah speaks about the fasting, unless you are sick, women who fear for their baby's life, that's the high risk pregnancy. Those are the women that fall in the category of not having to fast, but instead pay the ransom. Ibn Abbas said, for you women who fear for your baby's life or yours, you pay the ransom. That's the same thing Ibn Umar said. That's also the same thing Aisha said. Let's not leave Aisha out. Aisha was also one of the first scholars of Islam, long before the mother people. And she said the same thing too. Fasting women they are obligated to fast unless they are high risk. If you are a high risk pregnancy, your doctor told you that it's a risk, then you don't fast and you do not. I repeat, you do not. I repeat again, you do not have to make the days up by fasting. Instead, as Ibn Umar and as Ibn Masood and as Ibn Abbas said and Aisha, you fall in the category of ransom. So if you're pregnant, you pay the money for those days that you can't fast. You don't have to fast to make them up. Allah would never punish you twice or uh, subject you to twice. So it doesn't matter how many months pregnant you are. You should be fasting unless you're high risk. And by the way, fasting is good for you. A Muslim doctor will tell you if you're pregnant, fasting is good for the pregnant woman because something that we women tend to do when we're pregnant is overeat. So fasting is good for you and it's good for the baby. So yes, you should fast. And the ransom is paid if you were high risk. And by the way, anyone, whether you're pregnant or not, anyone who breaks their fast before my grip, your fast doesn't count. You cannot break your fast before my grip. 
If you broke your fast before my grib, you have to make that day up. That's based on the hadith of the prophet. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever breaks the fast before the time, the fast is invalid and you have to redo that day. Now, for you women that didn't know that you were supposed to fast, because Sheikh Kamadama doesn't, gave a thicker class and told you that it was a choice. But now you're hearing from Layla what Ibn Masood said, what Ibn Umar said, and what Ibn Abbas said, who out Trump the Sheikh Kamadama doesn't. Again, Allah doesn't hold you accountable for that misinformation that them brothers gave you. But now that you know you're supposed to be fasting, you fast. Hello. So Ramadan ain't started yet, women. You, if, Unless you have risk, you better be hitting that, that intention to fast. And by the way, you do not, I repeat, you do not, I repeat, you do not have to make intentions every day, every night. You can make one intention to fast for the entire month. Some of the companions did that. Some of the companions found that easier for them. Because if when traveling and fighting and battles, it's hard to remember to make that intention. So one intention for the entire month is sufficient if that's what you choose to do. And I tell all my students here, because we, man is forever at loss. Man is forever forgetful. Shaitan never sleeps. Shaitan's going to always make something happen where you forget to make intentions. I tell all my students, make your intentions for the whole month, the first day. And don't worry about it until your period comes. Then you make it again. Or until you travel, then you make it again. Like the companion said, that was easier for many of them. Y'all see how I'm answering. And I'm not making up none of these hadiths. All these hadiths are authentic. All these hadiths can be found in the authentic books. It ain't my fault that you guys don't know them. I learned these hadiths as a kid. Subhanallah, reinforced by my teachers. Sheikh Morsi's on standby if y'all want to have a stand down. <laughs> Okay, next question. <laughs> Women got to be tough. We got to be tough. Y'all know I'm not as, for those of you listening to me for the first time, I'm not as tough as I appear to be. People in my Zoom will tell you, Lele, nothing but a big cry, baby. But when you get on this TV, a woman got to stand tall. Because she's, it's a man's world. Y'all know that song. It's a man's world. And that ain't no lie. For a Muslim woman, it's a man's world. We got to stand tall like Aisha and let him know we ain't going to be overlooked. <laughs> but I'm not the way I appear, y'all. I'm really a nice, sweet person. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Next question. My sister said, I need to pay a student payment and a storage payment. Will donating plasma for, for sale to pay these two payments still be unexceptional? Oh my God. Okay. Guys, some of you guys, let me tell you how women are a little different than men. Women got insight that men don't have, that women's premonition. Okay. This is the this is the third time that this same person asked the same question, but she has asked it three different ways. Men don't pick up on that. Women do. The answer remains the same. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it is haram to sell your blood. So you can change the question around, use bigger words, more urban words. The answer remains the same. You first of all, you shouldn't have took out that student loan. That was stupid, wasn't it? You'd listen to Shaitan instead of listening to Layla. Okay, I told y'all not to take them loans out. I told you not to do it. You didn't want to listen to me. 
And then when you took the loan out, you found out, guess what? You didn't get none of that money anyway. It went right to that college and you stuck with the bill. You better get on the phone and call. They do have government programs now that will excuse you of your student loans. Get busy. They will forgive you of your student loans. Y'all need to get busy looking for those programs to get those loans written off. Okay. But the answer is you cannot sell your blood for nothing. All right. Keep your blood in your body. We don't sell it. Everybody understand? So instead, just take, uh, you know, look for, they do have, they'll, they'll uh, alleviate those student loans for you now. Those, they call them loan forgiveness programs. That's something that the government put in effect. Check that stuff out, but you cannot sell your blood for no reason. Is it the same that you cannot donate your blood? Donating and selling is not the same. You can give, but we cannot sell. Okay. Giving is good. Selling is another thing. Remember, y'all change the words. Got to know how to play the word game, too, with people. Yeah. Go ahead. Next Jamila question. Jamila has a question. Jamila, ask your question. Okay, some questions here. Yeah, y'all can get on the mic. Y'all know I can't see it because it's. Now I'm gonna tell y'all yeah, all this. Her head up for a long time. And y'all know um, I'm not looking at that either. I'm looking at four cameras. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. My question was is that let's just say, for instance, like Dur has already passed, but you're taking a nap, and then uh, sometimes you take one of those quick naps, and when you wake up, and you're like, oh my god, I missed Asa, and you jump up and go and do voodoo, and then you go ahead and do the Asa, but Asa has not come in. So when us uh, do come in, do you? Have okay, Jamila had a very good question here. Go ahead with your question again, Jamila. Yes, I was saying that. Let's just say, for instance, if Dur has already passed, and you take a nap uh, at that time, and uh, when you wake up very quickly, you're thinking that uh, Asa has already passed, so you jump up and do Wudu, and then you go and make that prayer, thinking you're doing Asa. And then maybe also it hasn't even come in 30 minutes. You know, it's going to take 30 minutes for it to come in. And then when you find it, you know, realize it, do you have to do that prayer? Uh, forget about the prayer that you made and then do Asa. Okay. Remember the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the only excuse for missing a prayer out of this prescribed time is sleep or forgetfulness. Every prayer be, uh, ends at the beginning of the next, except for Fajr. So sleep, we're not, that's when the pen is lifted. So say, for example, you go to sleep and you miss out on Asr. You wake up, it's time for my grib, let's say. What do you do? The prophet said, if you sleep, miss a prayer due to sleep, then make it as soon as you wake up. So what you do is when you wake up, you make wudu and make your asr, and then you make your maghrib. That's real simple. I'm going to tell you guys, when I used to work, y'all know my two hardest prayers were dur and asr because I work third shift, and I'm back on third shift with this sleeping thing. That means I would oversleep and miss dur and asr, both of those prayers in the wintertime because they come so close. So I'd have to wake up. I'd wake up at my grip. And I'd be so angry with myself because I would try to, I just couldn't do it. So I'd have to get up. I'd make dur, then I'd make asr, then I'd make my grip. I'd be making three prayers. And by the way, the prayers are made in the order in which they come. You don't make asr first and then uh, make uh, uh, dur. You make dur first, then asr. Does that answer your question, Jamila? So you just, whatever prayers you missed because you were asleep, you make wudu and make them as soon as you wake up in the order that they come in and then make whatever prayers in at that time. I understand that part, but I'm just saying like, okay, you done made your father, you made your door prayer. So you took a nap. Nap is sleep. You went to sleep. But you wake up thinking that you have overslept and you did not, uh, you, you missed also. So you go, Refresh yourself 
and then you do the asa prayer. And? And then later on, you find out that the asa had, ne- had not even came in then. Okay, and then it doesn't count. You can't pray a prayer before it's time. Allah says in the Quran that every prayer has its fixed time. What does that mean? A lot of these brothers don't understand what that means because they don't understand what hadith goes with it. The prophet said you will never understand what the Quran till you learn the hadith. The prophet explained that. He said the fixed time means that every prayer lasts until the beginning of the next. Okay? You cannot pray a prayer before it's time because that prayer wasn't in. Unless you're traveling, of course, there's exceptions. You can combine prayers then. But if you're at home and you made a prayer outside of its time frame, that prayer didn't count. So you have to go remake it within its time frame. Yeah, real simple. Just make it. You know, if you thought it was, if you made Oscar too early, don't worry about it. Just go make it. Again. Yeah, right. Within the time frame. Yes. It happens too. And I want you sisters to know something else. A lot of the sisters here are elderly. A lot of the sisters here are sickly. As my mother says, you got a lot of sick old women in there. (laughs) Sometimes, I mean, for those women here and they know who they are, who are sickly, you can combine. Because a lot of times we forget. A lot of the sisters here may suffer with diabetes. And from what I am learning, um, a lot of the people with diabetes, they lose their memory. They have a hard time remembering things. So you can combine. Is that prayer, is that going through to you guys? Malion? Hello, you're live on the air with Sister Layla Nashiba. Wait a minute, hold on for one second. Let me fix. I'm trying to fix your sound so I can hear you. Why can't I hear on there? Okay, hold on. Talk again, brother. Just keep talking. Let me see if I can get your sound so I can hear you. Oh, God. Wait a minute. It's me. There you go. Say it again. Asalaamu Alaikum. Yeah, now I got you. Walaikum Salaam. Okay. Okay. So I figured this is a perfect time to put out the call since we're talking about the various salawat and their times. So uh, I'm in training for a locomotive engineer, and um, you know if I'm operating these trains, these trains are on a tight schedule, and uh, you know I, I may have to, I may have to be, I may have to stay focused on operating this train through an entire salat, like salat al maghrib or dhuhr and asr within the in winter because their time is very short. So what should I do? Uh, how, how do I accommodate the, the salawat if, if I'm, uh, yeah, you, I'm operating a train? Yeah, you fall in the category of combining. That's how Allah, this is what I was just speaking about. Uh, if you're sick or in your case, because what I know what you do. I was married. My first husband did that type of work. Yeah, and you have to be focused on that. So you can combine. You can combine your uh, dhur and asr just like the doctors do. A lot of the uh, Muslim doctors, because they got surgeries to do and they can't stop a surgical pray, combine your prayers. Do dhur and asr together and do maghrib and isha together. You fall in the category of combining when you're on the job doing that because you can't take your eyes off that train. I know. So do your dhur and asr together and do your maghrib and isha together. Does that answer your question? Very well. Thank you. Yes, it does. Okay. All right. If you have any other questions, just call in. Okay. 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 As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaykum salam. Yeah, that's what I was speaking about, guys. Some of us fall in the category of combining. And like his case, he's got the, he's running that train. I know it what he's doing because my ex-husband, my first husband used to do that. And uh, that's what he would do. He used to combine. He'd have to combine his prayers in that process. Okay. Anissa does that too. Anissa's a bus driver. In the wintertime, the prayers come and she can't stop that bus. So what Anissa will do is combine. Uh, for you women that are sickly because and you can't remember what time of day it is. 
You sisters can combine, do Thor and Aser together and Maghrib and Isha together. Some women are elderly, not to the point where they look like that picture I showed y'all in class, but they're elderly losing their, their memory. As they get closer and closer to death, they lose their memory. So they have a hard time staying awake at night. You can combine too. Like, uh, for example, let me use my mother as an example. Say my mother, my mother is elderly in age. I'm talking about an age. She's, and she's had a stroke before. And ever since my mother had that stroke, she has a hard time remembering things. And she has a hard time staying awake. It's one of the side effects. Plus, she's had other medical issues too. And like in the summertime, when Isha doesn't come into 11, my mother be like, I can't stay awake. She can combine. She can do my grip and Isha together and go to bed because it's, and it's hard for her to stay awake for Isha. And she's not going to wake up when she do go to sleep. Okay. So in her case, she can, I have to tell her every year, mama combine my grip and Isha combine my grip and Isha and go to bed. So Allah made the religion easy for us guys. It's just that we have to learn from the proper sources. A lot of us are learning our religion from people who are teaching us from fatwa instead of teaching us from the prophet and those companions. When you learn the hadith guys, you fall in love with the prophet. You fall in love with his companions and you fall in love with Islam. People ask me, people who've known me all my life, because I grew up here in America. Oh, you still Muslim? Yep. I love my religion. I love it because it's so easy to be Muslim. But y'all see, I base everything on those hadiths, not no fatwas and not no methabs. I don't. All this is in the Sunnah. None of this stuff is made up. It's all from the Sunnah. So combine if you have a hard time remembering. I tell Latifah that. Sometimes Latifah say, Layla, I don't remember if I prayed. Combine, because I know her sickness. You combine your Dhur and Asr. That way, Latifah, you don't have to wonder it can't rem if you prayed it or not. Combine your uh, Maghrib and Isha. You are in that category due to your sickness. Because I know her sicknesses. Okay? Y'all get that? Does that answer that question? And if a, a job like this brother has, he can combine. A job like Anissa has as a, a bus driver, she can combine. When those prayers come in quick like that. All right. Any other questions? Go ahead with them, guys. When a Muslim woman has a baby with a non-Muslim man, but the family makes him convert. Is he actually a Muslim? <laughs> Boy, this shows how messed up our nation is. You know, first of all, again, you guys are marrying your Muslim daughters to Kafir men. It's just sad. Once a person say declares la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, that makes them Muslim. Anybody that declares la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah is a Muslim. The question ain't whether or not the man is Muslim. The question is whether or not her marriage was valid. Because if her parents married her to a non-Muslim man, that marriage is not valid. If he converted to Islam afterwards, her marriage still ain't valid. Okay? So the question in that case is not whether or not he's a Muslim. The question is whether her marriage is valid. But anyone, to answer the question, anyone who declares la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, that's a Muslim. Whether they practice the religion or not, we don't call them kafirs or nothing. Whether they practice or not, they're still a Muslim unless they deny, until they deny la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, they are Muslim. That means their blood their property and their honor are sacred with us, whether they're practicing it right or not. Unfortunately, that's how it is. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? 
It seems very difficult to get apartments and cars without having credit and getting involved with interest. What advice do you have for Muslims with managing living in America without getting involved with interest? What is forbidden and what is permissible? Okay, this is that this is one of the signs of the last hour. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said one of the signs of the last hour will be that the whole world is into this interest. And that's what it is, not just here in America, but everywhere, e even Saudi Arabia, okay, everywhere. There's interest. Okay, um, interest we know is a horrific sin. And as Muslims, we try to avoid it as much as possible. And we cannot say that the country, because of the country we live in either. When the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sent Mu'ad to uh, Yemen as the first messenger among, for the people, he told him, you're going to a country where everyone deals in interest. But just because they deal in interest doesn't make it lawful. He said, you try to stay away from it to the best of your ability. Okay. So we can't use America as an excuse because guess what? It's everywhere anyway, even in Saudi Arabia. Okay. But in regards to interest, you try to get around it. Some things we can't avoid, such as health insurance. If you ain't got health insurance, that you ain't going to get no health insurance. Okay. Burial insurance. If you don't have burial insurance, your behind going to be cremated and burned, which is a worse sin. So something car insurance. If you don't have car insurance in America, you can't drive because you're going to jail. So some things we just can't avoid. Then there's other things we can avoid, such as buying a house. Who said you have to buy a house? You can do like me, rent a house, rent an apartment. That doesn't entail interest. So some things we can get around, okay? Credit cards. Nowadays, if you ain't got a credit card, you ain't got nothing. But there's different kinds of credit cards out there. My first two credit cards were with, what was that bank? Capital One. They were no interest. One thing about America we can thank the Jews for because the Jews have a, a, a is forbidden for them to indulge in interest too. America is a Judeo-Christian society. That's why their meat is lawful. And one thing the Jews did, the Orthodox do, Jews did, we can they're the ones that came up with the no interest credit cards. They're the ones that came up with the no interest this, the no interest that. So there are no interest credit cards you can get. You can get a Capital One or a Premier Bank. I had a Premier Bank. In fact, I still got them. My credit cards are with Premier Bank and Capital One. They have no interest credit cards. I even got my granddaughter up on one. We pay it off. We put a limit on it. You put a $500 limit on it. So that way, you know, you don't get caught up in interest. I can pay $500. The credit card will only allow you, you know, to go up to 500 or 200, whatever you set your, I set my granddaughter's limit at a 150 because I know she can pay $150. So there's a way to get around interest here in America. You just have to find out. But you got to have credit. Without credit, you have nothing here. Get you a no interest credit card. You have to have a bank. Get you a no interest bank account like I got. Instead of buying a car, lease like I do. I have a brand new 2023 uh, RAV4 four wheel boop ba doo ba da. I lease it. Okay? So you can get around interest. Going to college, you ain't got to take out a student loan. Go to a state university. State universities have grants and all kind of scholarships and financial aid to get you through. I graduated from Cleveland State University. I got two bachelor's degrees, one in communications, the other in ancient civilizations. And I didn't pay a dime to go to school. I had all kind of financial aid and grants and loans, not loans, uh, student loans, grants. And uh, what's that? I worked for the Vindicator, the newspaper there. They called it a stipend. I had stipends and stuff. 
So instead of trying to go to those private schools that you can't afford, go to a state university, which is much more cheaper. So there's ways to get around interest, guys, if you really wanted to. Yeah, most of my credit cards are not interest. They got limits to be paid off so I can pay them off without getting into that. My brother, one of my brothers hooked me up with that type, these type of cards. Capital One, Premier Bank. Those are the best. Set a limit. Go ahead. Next question. When someone is fasting while at work and they get out of work around the time we break the fast, should they eat immedi immediately or wait until they get home? No. This is something we're going to talk about. You don't delay breaking the fast. You break the fast immediately. Now, as far as eating your dinner, that's up to you. But you have to break your fast on time. When the Adhan for my grip is called, you drink some water or eat a date or eat a piece of fruit and break your fast immediately. Okay. And now if you want to eat dinner, you can wait till you get home or you can eat on the job. That's up to you. But there is no delaying the breaking of the fast. And we're going to go into great detail about that. I'm going to go into detail about that next week. Uh, for our classes on uh, uh, when Ramadan starts. Okay. Here's a question that's on my, y'all see it? I, I see it on the screen. Woman, woman is single with six-year-old son. How do they line up to pray since she still has to lead while he learns? Okay, let's start with that part of the question first. Okay, uh, uh, how do they line up? You really need to train your sons. Do you have any, uh, she's a single with a six-year-old son. Okay, you can, the woman would stand in front because his prayer doesn't really count. Uh, you can, you would be the one to stand in front. But um, just so you sisters know, let me switch the camera. I'm trying to switch the camera. Hold on. Ah. If your son knows the fact he had, he would lead you. The only Quran that you have to know is El Fatiha. So if your six year old son knows El Fatiha, he would lead you in prayer. He stands in front and you stand behind him. Okay, so that's how we line up. The women and men don't stand together. The men are in front or your son will be in front of you and you would be in a row behind them. So if your son knows El Fatiha, then he will lead the prayer. Does everybody understand that? If he doesn't know El Fatiha, then you let him watch you pray. Because I'm going to tell you guys, I really don't like this idea of women even leading a six-year-old because a big bitter has emerged in the Muslim lands, the Arabic lands, where my father's from, Egypt. Can y'all believe they got women leading men in the prayer? They got women calling the Adhan sacrilege. So if your son is only six years old, I would tell you to let him watch you pray. I wouldn't want you leading even him. Have him watch you pray to learn how to pray. To learn how to pray means he's watching you. And when he learns El Fatiha, then that's when you show him outside the prayer how to pray. You don't wait until it's time to pray. If he's six years old, teach him how to pray when it's not time for a prayer. Because I don't want you sisters leading a boy, period. Because a man's prayer is not valid. I'm, this is what the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. A man's prayer is not valid if he's led by a woman. So that means your son's prayer is not valid if he's led by you. 
So if you're going to teach your son how to pray, you teach him outside the prayer. And then when he learns El Fatiha and he's learned how to do the positions outside the prayer, now he can lead you. Y'all understand that? That's what teach means. Teach means outside the prayer. But women do not lead boys and they do not lead men. Y'all understand that? This is wrong. Because that little boy's prayer is not accepted because he was led by you. You invalidated the prayer because you can't lead. Not because you walked in front of him. Like Aisha said, just because a woman walks in front of a man when he's praying, your prayer is not invalidated. But if you got a woman leading you, oh yeah, it's invalidated then. So teach your son how to pray outside the prayer. And when he learns how to pray, let him lead you. And Allah knows best. Next question. Oh, 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 that's the same question. I'm sorry, guys. Hold on. There's a second part to it. Also, is it okay for her to pray entirely aloud so he can hear? Again, teach your son the prayer outside the prayer. You don't have him praying with you. You teach him how to pray like we teaching the kids on our website. Okay, teach him how to say Fatiha. Teach him how to say Allahu Akbar outside the prayer, not during the prayer. You know, that's not how we roll as Muslim women. Okay, so teach him everything outside the prayer and have him watch you pray. But not pray with you. Everybody got it? Did I explain that good, Fresno? Hope it's clear. Big innovation with that going on. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. Wait a minute, hold on. I'm, I'm going to put this up so y'all can see. Can the people on YouTube see this, uh, Facebook see this one? Here's one. If a person is an overthinker and they know those thoughts are from Shaitan. Is there anything one can do the prophet recommend? Okay, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us whenever we get crazy thoughts, there's one statement to say that'll take them away. And that is, a'udhu billahi min shaitan urjim. That's it. So if you're overthinking anything, say a'udhu billahi min shaitan urjim. Because overthinking comes from your gin. Your gin hoovers around in your heart looking for reasons to attack you, looking for ways to attack you. He will push you to be a fanatic if he sees that you're strong. Overthinking comes from fanaticism. Overthinking is a form of fanaticism. So if you are overthinking anything, even writing a book report, if you're overthinking it, even a person like me, an author, if I'm writing a, my novel and I start overthinking, I say, "Audu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim." Subhana Allah. Call upon Allah. Subhana Allah. That'll take that those that over that'll snap that jinn away and push you back to your feet. Something as simple as that. Subhana Allah. Or "Audu billahi." Okay. That'll keep them away. That's what our prophet taught us. You ain't got to go through no uh, song and dance. You don't have to go through no certain rituals. Just a'udhu balahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim or subhanallah. Yeah. Any other questions? If shaytan is locked up during the month of Ramadan and the kafirs start picking on you, more than they usually do? Is it their personal gin pushing them to make you angry? Yes. I want you guys to understand when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that the, the shay, uh, during the month of Ramadan, Shaitan, Iblis, is locked up and the most evil gin, the Ifrit, he's not talking about your personal gin. He's talking about the Ifrit, which are the most dangerous and the most evil of all, Jen. The Ifrit don't waste their time on people like you or me. 
The Efreet is going to go after the people that's married and try to destroy their marriages. They're going to try to uh, go after uh, those uh, the real scholars and try to get them to renege on their belief. They don't waste their time with pe peasants like us. OK, but your personal gin is never locked up. He will stay with you until you die. And even at death, he'll be trying to get you to renege in your belief. So, yes, when we're fasting, nobody else's gin is locked up. So you're going to be provoked even more by the, your, your family, by the non-Muslims, by your own emotions and all of that stuff, too. It's going to be even more so during Ramadan. That's why the prophet said, seek refuge in Allah. Say, I'udu billahi min a shaitan al I'm fasting. I'm fasting. And say it out loud. When you say it out loud, you're also reminding yourself that you're fasting. And that jinn hears it and it'll go sit down. Because one thing about the jinn, they're weak. All you have to say is one name and a jinn will go away. Just say Allah and they'll go, they'll run. Allah, your personal jinn, will go and hide in the corners of your heart. He'll come back after a while, but it makes them, it throw, knocks them back, knocks them back whenever they hear the name of Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, mention the name of Allah and it'll make your jinn run away. But he'll come back, but he'll run away. That's why we say Allahu Akbar when we're praying. That's why we raise our hands up, okay? Because this is pushing the jinn back, pushing the jinn back. Allahu Akbar, get back. That's why we raise that finger up and down when we're saying a tashahu. It becomes like a bar, keeps them back, keeps them back, okay? All right, good jobs. Any other questions? Can you pray if you have prolonged bleeding due to the depot shot and your doctor tells you it's normal? Again, you look at the color of the blood and you sisters determine whether or not it's a menses or not from the color of the blood. If it's a menses, you do not pray. You wouldn't feel comfortable praying with that black stuff. Y'all know what that black stuff look like. Or that brown stuff. That's nasty looking too. Or that red, ooh, thick red stuff. Or that pink stuff. Or that yellow stuff. See, the brothers can't get graphic because they don't know what a menses look like. I do. Okay? It ain't pleasant. We ain't talking about the smell. Let's just get graphic, women. Brothers, stand down. Not just the, 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 the color. Y'all know that smell? Do you feel comfortable standing before your Lord with that nasty stuff clotting out of you? And it's in clots too. And it stinks so bad. That's a menses. We do not pray or fast in that condition. Now, I'm going to tell y'all how Istahada blood looks because I went through Istahada before I had my hysterectomy. Yeah, I had a hysterectomy too. I already had my kids though, so it didn't matter. I didn't care about this. It was a blessing for me. Best thing that ever happened was the hysterectomy. Istahada menses blood is different, guys. It might be uh, pink in color, light, but it's light. There's no clots in it. It's just light bleeding. It's not gushing out. It's my, you will see a few, you don't even really need a, 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 a cotex or a tampon with it. It's just light bleeding. You might can put a little toilet paper in your underwear. And it, it's just a light pink color, but there's no smell to it. That's how I knew. That's how you know something wrong with you too. It's no smell. It doesn't have that menses nasty smell. It's not the clots. It's not that thick stuff. It's just a light bleeding. That's istahada. In that case, 
That's when a woman can just simply wash her private parts, put a Kotex on or a tampon in and go and pray. You don't feel dirty. You don't feel nasty in that condition because it's just a light little pink or a little real light red color. I'm like, what is this? Man, this ain't no menses. What the heck is something? Did I cut something? Like you cut something. What is this? Different. It's the hotter blood. Is lot, it's not a menses blood. Do you understand? Do you women, under, the brothers are probably feeling putrid, but I'm sorry. It takes a woman to talk about these things. Okay. So do you, you sisters get it? Y'all know that bleeding I'm talking about. If y'all see that type of bleeding, that's light and it's not even gushing. It's just, oh, I see a spot like, it's like spotting. Oh, it's a little spot. Ah, what's wrong with this? What, what happened? That's Istahada and it doesn't stop. It's a sign there's something wrong with you. Go to the doctor. Now, those pills and shots that she's talking about, yes, that's normal. Those type of shots are dangerous too. There's other forms of contraceptive besides those. I know when I used to work, they used to give some of my clients those shots and they stopped because those shots messed up their whole cycle. Okay? Those shots produce menses. You're on your period. That stuff is not istahada. That's period blood. And y'all know it. Look at the color. Look at the smell. That's a menses. That is not istahada. Did I get graphic enough? I mean, a prayer is no form. You think they understand? Y'all think of that? Does a sister understand now? Ask the one who asked that question, does she understand? I have to get graphic. Okay. Okay, here's another question. Can y'all see it on YouTube? From Sister Serene. She said, I had a question regarding the travel player prayer. She said, I know when you travel to a place that becomes your daily routine, you don't pray to travel prayer. Exactly. So what's your question? Well, oh, well, oh, wait a minute. She got more to it. Okay, let me see. What if you aren't going to the house as often as you used to? No, it's not. That's what I was trying to explain yesterday, Serene. I fit what you're talking about. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. You, are, you understand how that suburb stuff works. I'm telling y'all, New Yorkers understand too. They got those burls. Even though, you know, it, I mean, it, it's not your regular routine. In that case, a person can still uh, 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 combine and shorten. You can still combine and shorten. Uh, that's the concessions of a law. So yes, yes, you can. That's still the travel prayer. Yeah, that's still traveling. Yeah. Okay. For example, I don't go to Cleveland Heights. My mother lives in University Heights. Mukhtar lives in Cleveland Heights. Latifa you lives in East Cleveland. I don't go on that side of town, but maybe once a month. Well, only if the mosque is selling dinners. <laughs> I don't even go once a month. <laughs> If Mukhtar and them, if the mosque is selling those chicken dinners, I'll go and I'll drive a hundred hours to get them chicken dinners. <laughs> but I don't go. So that, that's not part of my regular routine. So if I wanted to, I could combine and shorten. I don't, but I could. Okay. That's still, that. that's a traveler because that's not my regular residence. I don't go on that side of town for nothing unless the mosque is selling them chicken dinners. That's the honest to God truth. I don't go visit my mother that often. She don't never answer her door. I ain't driving an hour away to bang at the door and my mother don't hear the door and she don't hear her phone either. So I don't go over her house. <laughs> Latifa sleep. Why would I go to Latifa's house? She ain't gonna hear the door either. She's somewhere asleep. Well, she got her grandkids running through the house and it ain't my babies. It's the other ones. 
I don't go over my daughter's house. She ain't home. Okay, yeah. So, yes, that's still a traveler. You could, you technically, yes, that's a traveler. You could combine and shorten. You know, I don't do that, but you could. That's still, that's a concession from Allah. That shows the mercy of Allah. We talked yesterday, guys, in the class we did uh, from the book of Sheikh Atlee's on um, uh, Get to Know Allah. We talked about two of Allah's names. El Rahman and El Rahim. How does Allah show us His mercy? Look at how we can, He made it so easy for us to travel. I live an hour away from my family, even though we technically in the same city, just different suburbs. Allah made it so easy that if I wanted to, I could combine and shorten my prayers if I went to see my mother. I could combine and shorten my prayers if I went to see my daughter. I could combine and shorten my prayers if I went to visit my best friend. Okay, that's the mercy of Allah. He is El Rahman, El Rahim. But that's only if you stick to the Sunnah. Those hadiths we, we went over yesterday, y'all saw the source. Those hadiths are all authentic. That's Bukhari, Muslim, Muwatta, Ahmed, Termidi. But you don't hear these brothers mentioning these hadiths. When they do their lectures on the fiqh of prayer, they're always reading from somebody's book. Sheikh so-and-so's book. Imam so-and-so's book. Or they're following a methab. They don't do like I do, just take it right out the hadith. SubhanAllah, the religion is beautiful and easy, guys. But we have to learn it correctly. We have to learn traditional Islam. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this nation will divide into over 73 sets. All of them will be in the hellfire except for those who stick with the traditional Islam, the traditional Islam, the traditional Islam. And one of the companions said, what's the traditional Islam, O prophet of Allah? He said, the traditional Islam is what I am here to give to you. The traditional Islam is what you are upon. The traditional Islam is what the first four leaders that come after me will be upon. He says, stick to those who are upon the traditional Islam, even if it means you have to hold on to the bark of a tree. He knew this would happen. That instead of us following what he said, will be taking fatwa from imams and people that came after him and those companions. will worship those that came after them instead of adhering to what those came with. And when you brothers do that, y'all make this deen too complex for women. That's why we have a high apostasy rate. What caused me to sit up here after all these years? I could have done an Ask Sister Layla Live years ago. Why am I doing it now, though? Because I'm sick of seeing women coming into this religion and apostate because you brothers told them things about the dean that ain't true. You brothers told them that they can't be beautiful, that they have to lose their femininity. They can't wear makeup. They can't wear and polish all this dumb stuff that is not true. And then when they ask for Dalil, you can't bring Dalil. You read a fatwa from Sheikh Kamadam a dozen. What did Aisha say about makeup? What did Ibn Abbas say? What did Ibn Umar say? What did Abu Bakr say? What did U Y'all can't come with the real Dalil. I got it though. Aisha said, a woman can show this and whatever makeup and jewelry she has on this. That's the same thing that Ibn Abbas said. 
That's the same thing that Ibn Umar said. That's the same thing that Umar said and that Abu Bakr. Stop reading fatwas from men who came after them. Because the prophet said the sunnah will become abandoned. The religion will become distorted. It will end up being like it was before Islam. And that's what's happening today. Because you brothers and y'all call yourself men of the sunnah. If you of the sunnah, prove it. Quote those hadiths. Quote those companions. Take those methabs. And fatwas from Islam Q&A. Yeah, that's where y'all getting them answers from. Oh, yeah. Islam Q&A and throw them in the garbage. Then people will stop accusing me of making them up. Because I'm showing them the hadith. Even the sources. By the way, Sheikh El Bani said the same thing too. Even he said the fatwa of Aisha. Y'all want to know the fatwa of Aisha? Sheikh Elbani mentioned it. Sheikh Elbani mentioned Aisha's fatwa and everybody. Go read what Sheikh Elbani had to say. Since a lot of y'all just do what Sheikh Elbani said. Even he said, according to Aisha and Ibn Abbas, a woman can show her face, her hands, and whatever makeup and jewelry is on them. That's from Aisha's fatwa. And the companions. Next question. A single woman wants to teach her son Islam, but she is a new convert and she's still learning herself. Can you please do parenting series, how to raise young kids? Okay. Alhamdulillah. We have a Sunnah Followers Kids program here every Sunday. Every uh, every Sunday is Sunnah Followers. By the way, guys, my Zoom room is open. Is that going up there? Our Zoom room is open 24 hours a day. And on Sundays from 1 uh, until 3, 30, 4 o'clock, we teach the kids hadith and we teach them the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Arabic, okay? And also, guys, every you should join my classes every day at 6. What you learn in my classes it, is what you should be teaching your children. As you guys saw today, look at my re, um, my live stream. The children were in here answering the questions. Sabrina, Amira, the kids are the ones in here answering. Your children can join my classes to learn too. Uh, the sister that's reading the questions for y'all, Yasmin, she's married now and just had a baby. She grew up on my website. She's been coming here since she was like 11 or 12 years old. OK, your children should be joining my classes with you. Come to my classes and bring your children because I'm teaching Tawheed, which is the basis of Islam. And uh, you, in turn, can teach it to your children. Your children will catch on quicker, better than you do, because our kids here are so smart. They answer these questions better than their adults do. But yes, sister, just uh, stick with us here, you know, as soon as followers. And if you guys look at the ticker there, www.sunnafollowers.net, that is our uh, website. You can join our Zoom room from that link. You'll also uh, see um, uh, 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 the schedule of classes there and the donation tab too, okay? And our Zoom room is open 24 hours a day. And I try to broadcast all my lectures live like I'm doing now uh, here, okay? But yes, yes. But uh, have your kids join the Sunnah Followers um, Kids Program this Sunday at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. They'll love it. Yeah. Okay, did, did I get the tab right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Go ahead. I'm trying to work the camera. I put the tab up there, right? Yeah. Uh, where is that other tab thing? Hold on. How do I do this? Yeah. Did I do it? Yeah. And by the way, guys, please support this Dawah effort. I want you guys to know, you know, we are, you know, a website. We've been around since 1986. We're not affiliated with any masjid. 
We're just an online website run by myself and a bunch of other housewives and students. Sheikh Mustafa Morsi Abu Atayyip is our founding scholar. Okay. And we also have Dr. Jamali here and also Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli is one of our uh, uh, advisors and stuff here too. Okay. But the website is basically run by me and the housewives. Please support us. Uh, make sure you guys scan that uh, uh, scan thing there and support this Dawa effort. Look at all their blessings and rewards, inshallah, that you'll get. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead with them. As a Muslim, my first response to a Muslim brother is calling him a brother in faith. People keep telling me communi communicating that way will turn the men off and not want to marry me. How is that wrong? <laughs> Boy, we are a messed up nation today. First of all, we are brothers and sisters in Islam. This is what separates us from the Christians and Jews. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the greatest weapon that we have against shaitan is each other. We are all brothers and sisters in faith. So if you're calling someone your brother in faith, that's what he is. So there's nothing wrong with referring to someone as your brother in faith, but that ain't the question. Mel Dyer, pay attention to Layla Nasheba. Y'all got to be able to read between the lines of these females. If anyone can out trick Shaitan, it would be a woman. The question is, what are you doing up in some man's face calling him anything? That's the question. What are you doing trying to turn somebody on? That's the second question. If a woman wants to get married, do we run around men and hang out in their faces and, and sweeten our voices to them and call them my beloved brother? No. If you want to get married, you go tell your father and your father and your brothers and your uncles find a husband for you. You don't look for yourself. You sisters have got to stop looking like the Kaffir women. You have to stop taking on their actions, their character, their behavior. In Islam, we don't look for our husbands. The men find us through our guardian. If you are a convert to Islam, before you even think of marrying anyone, you have to have a guardian. The imam of the mosque becomes your guardian. You tell him you want to get married and you go home and pray and you wait for it to happen. It may take a, a day. It may take 10 years. However long it take, you accept the cutter of a law and keep it moving. But you ain't got no business hanging around a bunch of men, softening your voices. That's what you're doing. Oh, brother, this is not the behavior of a Muslim woman, it's the behavior of a prostitute, but not a Muslim woman. So first of all, sister, if you're looking for a husband, you better make do it to a law for a law to send you one. You don't go out in the streets looking. You don't go on dating apps looking. You don't go to the mosque. The mosque is a place of worship and it's for the men, not women. Your reward is at home. You just let your guardian do the looking for you, okay? But is there anything in Islam that forbids me from referring to a Muslim man as being my brother in faith? That's what he is. But the question is, what are you doing talking to men about anything to refer to them as anything? That's not how righteous women work. I want you guys to know, Allah says in the Quran, Righteous women are for righteous men and righteous men are for righteous women. Do you think a righteous man is going to be interested in a scallywag woman who walks around the mosque, hanging around the men, softening her voice, trying to pick up dudes? 
A righteous man would say that woman is crazy and wouldn't have nothing to do with you. All you're going to get is a person on your level. Water seeks his own level. So what you sisters need to do is let your guardians look for you a husband. And in the meantime, work on bettering yourself spiritually so that Allah will send you a righteous man instead of sending you a ghetto man, a sewer man. Because that's what you attracting is sewage, not men who are righteous. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, next question. Go ahead. What condition must be met for a woman to be able to work out outside of the home? For example, at the gym. Nowadays, they have all women gyms. Oh, okay. If you're going to an all women's gym, I used to be an aerobics instructor. <laughs> Remember that, Latifa? Can y'all believe it? When I was 20 years old, they had this place called Elaine Powers for women to work out at here where I live. I was an aerobics instructor. It was all women. They didn't allow men in there for nothing. If it's a women's salon like that, then that's fine. But still, you cover yourself. You don't walk around looking like Beyonce and Cardi B. You want to put on a jogging suit a jogging suit. That, that way you can exercise, work the machines and keep it moving. You don't put on no body suit. Even around other women, we have to be modest. You And now we got the GLGBQTFG community. And how do you know if those women in there are really women? They might be men who pretend to be women. That's the day that we're living in. So wear a jogging suit. Y'all know a real jogging suit? And by the way, Sister Pasha got some nice ones. I bought me a nice jogging suit from Sister Pasha. Jamila Pasha, check her out. Okay, get you a jogging suit and work out in. But as far as well in that, wearing those tight fitting body suits and stuff, even around women, we don't dress that way. And let me share some history with you guys. I like to always throw in examples from the companions. Aisha and the wise of the prophet, they never sh took off their hijabs and body and showed their bodies around each other. When the verses of hijab came down, the prophet's wives, they didn't show their bodies to each other when they, or anyone else. When someone came to visit, they would put on a hijab. Even if it was a woman coming to visit them, they would put on a hijab just out of modesty, just out of respect. Let's get back to being like those women because they were the best women of this nation, okay? They wouldn't walk around in no body suits at pumping the, the weights with each other, okay? So the proper dress would be to wear a jogging suit and of course your hijab, a jogging suit and a hijab and just keep it moving. If it's a male club, we don't go at all. And that goes for you brothers too. You brothers are not supposed to be working out with no women. Ballys, you brothers ain't got no business with no bally membership. Shame on you men. Always want to be oppressive towards women when you the ones doing all kind of crazy stuff, pumping iron with a bunch of women looking at you and don't think that we don't know you looking at them and probably doing other things too with them. Hello? Shame on you, brothers. And then you shaving your beards. Who you think you are? But you're going to tell me that I can't be a woman, that I can't be beautiful. But you at the gym pumping it with a bunch of Kafir women. Are you crazy, brothers? Y'all better get it together. Hit that topic. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Keep it moving. I'm told that I look married, so I don't get approach, approached for marriage. What does that mean? I have never heard anything like that before in my life. <laughs> Do I look married? I don't know what looking married. There's no, I don't know what looking married. The reason why you are not married is uh, approach is because it's not in the cards for you yet. Allah, you will get married when Allah has decreed for it to, it to happen. It will happen when it happens. There is nobody deserving of you now. Maybe you're such a good Muslim 
that Allah hasn't sent the person to you yet. Okay. Don't listen to stuff like that from ignorant people. There is no such thing as you look married. What that mean that you're more, you're a Muslim. Maybe they're trying to say that you look like a Muslim. Do you wear hijab and stuff and they don't? Yeah. Don't listen to all that type of stuff, guys. Uh, 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 women, you know, you'll get married. Just make do it. Go to your guardian and tell your guardian, Abu or whoever it is, I'm, I would like to get married and have them look for you. And in the meantime, just continue to practice your religion correctly. Come to my classes to learn the deen and keep making dua. And Allah will send you a man that's deserving of you. Because I don't know what that means, but whoever told you that, he seen to me like he ain't deserving of you. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Next question. My birth name is American. Muslims keep telling me to change my name to a Muslim name. Is that true? Okay. There is no such thing as a Muslim name. Okay. All beautiful names belong to Allah. And Allah is the creator of all language. Nowhere does Allah say in the Quran that in order to be a Muslim, you have to change your name to an Arabic name. Arabic is not a religion. Arabic is a language. It's not a religion. Nowhere did the prophet say you have to have an Arabic name to be a Muslim either. Okay. Salman El Farsi, he didn't change his name to no Arabic name. He was Persian. Okay. So you do not have to have an Arabic name to be Muslim, but I'll tell you why a lot of American Muslims have changed their names. A lot of American Muslims have changed their names upon embracing Islam because of the slavery. Many uh, 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 of them, their roots, you know, slaves were brought here from Africa and a lot of those African slaves were Muslim. They came from the West Africa. Muslim countries, okay? A lot of slaves came here from Nigeria. You do your DNA test, you're gonna see a high occurrence of Nigerian blood in you. Even I have that. My mother, my father was Arabic, but my mother is American. I got all kind of Bantu blood in me. I got blood in me from North Africa down to the tip. I got Somali, everything. Every country in Africa, okay? From north to south, north is my father, south, my mother. <laughs> I always make a joke out of it. But um, a lot of uh, African-Americans change their names to Arabic names because they don't have an identity anyway. They were stripped of their original identity when, they were, when their uh, forefathers were brought here to America as slaves. So upon embracing Islam, a lot of African-Americans changed their name from their slave master's name to a Muslim name, an Arabic name to start over. Because African-Americans, this is not their real name. Johnson, Harrison, that's not their, they're not from those people. Those were the slave masters who owned them. Now, unless you like my mother, my mother's Creole. She's a Giton. Her people were real. She's a descendant of, of, of Jean Guiton, but her people owned slaves. My mother's Creole. Her people were not slaves. They owned them. Okay. But most African-Americans, that's not their real name. So they've changed their name to, from away from their slave master name to a, a new name to start their life over again so that their offspring, you know, will not be affiliated with some slave master that they were not from anyway. You understand? But to answer the question, do you have to change to an Arabic name to be a Muslim? No, you do not. If you're, if you are happy with your name, if your name is Melinda Stalinsky, then you keep your name Melinda. And by the way, you never change your father's name. If your father's name is Stalinsky, that's your name. 
Melinda Stalinsky is a beautiful name. So there's no need to change it to an Arabic name. Now, if your name was Trinity, Trinity, this is something that goes against Islam. We don't believe in a Trinity. So if you wanted to change your name from Trinity to Aisha Stalinsky, you could do that. You can change it from, because the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if a person had a bad name, he would change it to a good name. Talking about the first name, not the name of their father, the first name. So if your name is Trinity Stalinsky, then you would change it to Aisha Stalinsky or Khadija or whatever you want, Stalinsky. You keep the Stalinsky, but you can change the first name. Does I answer that question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did I put it? Let me. Oh, I'm. I'm trying to look at it. I'm hitting that camera. Give me that camera again, guys. I'm trying to. Did I take it down? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Let me take it down. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. Let me um put this here. Yeah, we're almost wrapping up. Uh, it's after 10 o'clock. If that's all the questions, guys, we can, wait a minute, here it is. We can wrap it up. Okay, here's somebody. Thank you for all you do. May Allah bless you. Yeah, and you and your page has been so helpful for us. Alhamdulillah, uh, try to join uh, my classes. I've been streaming. All my classes, guys, are streaming live. I stream all my lectures live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter simultaneously. So all you have to do is just log in on YouTube and uh, you can catch my classes live. This Q&A is held every Friday from 8 to 10. And please, guys, donate. That's the thing, to help pay for these expenses. This program that I'm using, this new software that we're using that I'm really starting to like. I didn't like it at first, <laughs> but now that I'm learning how to work it by myself, there it is, Layla Nasheba. <laughs> now that I'm learning, uh-oh, did I work it right? <laughs> I don't know, I did something. How do I take the chat down? Oh, I don't know how to, oh, there it is. Now that I'm learning how to work it right, I kind of like this program. <laughs> Yeah, so you can all join our classes on Zoom. My Zoom room is open 24 hours a day. Pop in anytime you want to. Uh, 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 go to the, the website there at, at www.soonerfollowers.net. Am I here? Does that mean? Yeah, and that's how you join the Zoom room. And like I said, when the classes are live, I broadcast them on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and Instagram. But Instagram, let me tell y'all why it's not showing up on Instagram. Instagram is in beta. So they told me it may or may not show up my live stream because they're experimenting. It's not available uh, officially yet, okay? But I am streaming live my classes on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and um, Twitter. OK, and please support us. You know, it takes money to run this website. Subhanallah, this program that we're using is two hundred dollars a month. Please donate to support us. OK, are there any other questions? Because um, we're basically yes. out of time. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll take what, how many more are there? Uh, two more. OK, I'll do those two. Go ahead. If my YMCA has a woman only swimming, can I go and swim? Here we go again. Are there men? If there's no men, even with the women swimming, we don't wear bikinis. We don't wear bathing suits like that. We have to cover our bodies. You're going to have to get in that water and be covered. Now, this is when you can wear those so-called women's swimsuits. Those women's swimsuits, you can't wear them out on the beach nowhere because they show your body to men. But if you're in an all woman swimming pool, yes, those uh those uh Muslim women swimsuits that they made, you can wear them. 
wear one of them to an all women's swimming class. Because some of us need exercise. And your doctor may recommend water aerobic aerobics. I used to have to take it before I had bariatric surgery. And that's when I bought one of those suits. I was with all women, but I wore my uh, that suit. That's appropriate for wearing around women. But it ain't appropriate for wearing anywhere else because it's showing your body. But for the women, it's fine. You're covered up and uh, you know, skin is showing. And they're pretty cool. Those are pretty cool suits. So yes, if there's no men involved at all, yes, you can do it. And you still have to take the precautions of dressing appropriately. Okay. Yes. Next question. How do we distribute the animal that we sacrifice for the Akika? Okay. This is a good question. The Akika, one third to your family, one third to the poor, one third uh, uh, to your friends. Okay. Well, what usually happens is when we have an Akika, you know, they throw like a baby shower and the people come and bring you gifts and they come and eat from that lamb. But if you're not going to do it that way, then you distribute it that way. Give one third to the needy, the needy Muslims in your community. Okay. And another third to your family and your friends. And then another third, of course, for yourself. That's how that goes. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Was that it from YouTube too? That's it from YouTube too, right, guys? Yes. I okay. think Sabrina has a question. Go ahead. Uh, in bringing this up, um, what is it called when... Um, when when a person when when a, a couple gets married and for three days I heard for three days they celebrate the whatever word they use for that where the whole community Muslim community is invited out and they slaughter lambs. Okay, or- this is something that people do. I don't know what they do, you know. But this is you know the in Islam. You know we have a, a, a walima. And it don't last no three, four days. It's just we just get married and we serve some food. It ain't got to be no lamb. It's whatever you can afford. It could be some milk. The prophet's walimas were milk. The only walima he had were that they had meat at was uh, Zainab. But all his walimas was milk. So I don't know. But nowadays, Muslims are imitating the Kafir. They doing parties. Everybody want to drop it like it's hot, even though it's not. That's not the Islamic way of getting married. You got Muslims today being like the Kafir, spending all this money, having uh, wedding parties and all this, this crazy stuff. I don't know. That ain't Islam, no. It's not okay, Islam. Thank you. Because yeah. I see it a lot in the, in the community now. Yeah, they're imitating the Kafir. Remember, guys, the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said we will imitate them. The Sunnah will become abandoned. The Quran will disappear from the hearts of people and we'll end up becoming like the, like the Christians and Jews doing what they do. It's all about drop it like it's heart, even though it's not. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah, Sister Deborah, don't worry about it. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, you can go swimming. And um, about how, why do they, they say you look married? They probably jealous of you because you probably wearing hijab and doing what you supposed to do. And they're not. That's what I call that. That's the female thing because you are not like them. You wear hijab. You're trying to practice your deen correctly. And they're telling you because you're adhering to Islam. You're not going to find a man. Tell those women to get out of your life. You will find a man when a law de- decrees it to happen. In the meantime, you keep on bettering yourself. And when a man is, is, is worthy of you, he'll come. Hello. Tell those busybody women to get out of your life because they just jealous anyway. Y'all know how women are. Okay, here's another question in Zoom. I mean, um, 
uh, what is this, uh, YouTube, is complaining about something bad someone did to you, to someone else backbiting. Yes. A lot of people backbite their husbands. Let me tell you, sisters, about that. A lot of you women backbite your husbands. Unless you are complaining to someone who can help, like an imam, a counselor, or maybe uh, somebody's a parent, unless you're complaining to somebody who is in a position to help you, this is backbiting. We don't complain about our problems in life to others unless it's someone that can help us, that can talk to the person and help. A lot of you sisters have got to stop backbiting your husbands. If you got a problem in your marriage, take it to the imam or take it to a counselor who's in a position to help. But don't take it to the people who just want to hear your business. And you got to be careful with that because guess what? You'll be coming home. You done complained about your husband to your best friend. One day you come home, your best friend sitting there holding hands with your husband. And she'll look at you and say, hello, co-wife. So y'all women got to be careful of that. Big lesson to be learned. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Is that all the questions here? Okay, so I think there's okay. One go ahead. More. Go ahead. Uh, so go ahead. It says my wife keeps calling me by my name, which I don't like. I told her to call me by my Muslim name, but she won't. <laughs> Let me look at Zoom and see who asked that question. Hold on. Is it in the chat? Oh. It's from YouTube, actually. Oh, it's from YouTube. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to see if that was uh, Brother L. Bain or Brother or some one of my brothers here. That's why I was going to be careful how I answer this. <laughs> okay. You women out there, understand that making your husband happy this becomes a ticket, an easy ticket to paradise for us. Just like you would not want your husband to call you the B word. Let's just get real. You know how we women feel when a man refers to us as the B word. That's how a man feels. When you are referring to him by something from the Jahaliya that he's no longer a part of anymore. You women need to call him by his the name that makes him happy. Not the name that makes him unhappy. And imagine yourself if he used the B word with you. Because by you disobeying him, you're actually acting like the B word. So stop being the B word and give your husband the word and name that makes him happy, that makes him pleased with you. Because the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whenever your husband is pleased with you and happy with you, the angels of mercy are pleased with you and happy with you. And they go back and tell Allah that your husband is pleased with you and happy with you. And Allah will become pleased with you and happy with you. So sisters, don't do stuff like that. Call your husband by the name that makes him happy and what makes him feel special too. Okay, here's another question here. Some of the people, I'm, and the reason why I'm answering these questions because these people are, are not in America. They're in a different part. 
Okay, this person wants to know, is it possible to tell people living overseas to do, oh, uh, an akika, an akika for your children? Okay, the akika is done by you. You had the child. Let me tell you guys, what is the purpose of the akika? The purpose of the akika is to thank Allah for blessing you with this child. The child is yours. You had the baby. The akika is done by you, not by somebody else. It's your way of thanking Allah. We're sacrificing this animal in the name of Allah as thanks, as an offering of thanks to Allah for blessing us with a healthy child. You do the akika. Okay? Now, if you don't have any money, you're poor, and your family somewhere else wants to do it for you, they can. That's a blessing for them. That's a charity for them. Okay? If you can't afford to do an akika and somebody else wants to do it for you, then that's okay too. But can you tell somebody or make somebody overseas do an akika for you? No. Do you understand the answer? Do you understand? Or say, for example, you had the child but you want to get uh, send the stuff to them overseas, you can do that too. But the Akika is performed by you. You're the one that's thanking Allah for blessing you with this child. I hope my answer is clear. I hope I understand your question too. Did I get it right, uh, Alfonso? Did I get it right? Your, I understand your question right. Yeah. Any other questions? And like I said, I'm keeping it going because I know some of you are joining in on uh, the stream from uh, overseas too. I guess they find it better to join in live on YouTube than uh, call in on the phone. <laughs> By the way, we do have the phone lines too. Yeah. It's always better in person, isn't it? I tell y'all, it's always better to do stuff in person. Yeah, any other questions on the, over there, uh, Yasmin? You're welcome. No more questions. Okay, well, mashallah, guys. This was a great uh, a session. Wait a minute, here's one more. Please explain to these American Muslims how to properly do polygamy. Lord have mercy. That's a whole topic in and of itself. Okay. The proper way to do polygamy is the way the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to do it. And it starts off with those women not living together. It starts off with you brothers, first of all, being able to afford it. You Muslims living here in America, can you afford to take care of two, three or four homes, four households? Can you afford it? Are you capable of being just with your time? You got to work, dude. You got to work a lot to take care of more than one household. It takes two incomes to make it in America. So you got two jobs, three jobs. Where are you going to have the time to be equal with these women and how much time you spend with them and those children? Yeah, you brothers got to do polygamy the right way. We're not sister wives either. The LDS Mormon community is not Islam. Women don't live in the same house together. You don't put four families together. Every wife has her own home. My children belong to me. They don't belong to no, no other women. And I ain't responsible for no other woman's kids. You don't take from me to give to some other woman either. You don't lower my living standards just so you can take care of another woman either. Oh, that's a whole different topic. That's a whole class in and of itself. 
A lot of you brothers that's doing polygamy ain't doing it by the book of Allah. And you definitely ain't following the Sunnah of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So maybe we'll talk about that one day. Get it together, brothers. And for you sisters out there, I want you women to understand just like it's a man's right. You can't stop your husband from having two, three, or four. But it's also your right to walk away. If you feel that your husband will not be just with you, if your husband is not being just with you, you can ask for a kula. Okay? Islam is a check and balance. Allah doesn't force any of us into a situation that's bad for us. So you got rights too. If he's going to lower your living standards, if he's going to stop spending time with you the way he's supposed to, if he ain't going to be just and fair, then you sisters can get up out of that relationship. Brothers, Layla Nasheba is on YouTube now. I've been around since 86. Y'all know that. Y'all know who I am. Inshallah, these women, maybe they'll start listening to me now that I'm on YouTube. I'll tell them what their rights are. I'll tell them. And when I tell them, it's backed up with Quran and authentic hadith, not no fatwa. So you brothers better start treating these women right. Because when they come to me, I'm going to let them know that there's a way out. So y'all better get it together. All right. Okay, any other questions? All right, alhamdulillah, this was a very good session like all the others. I like the Q&A. I didn't think the Q&A would go so nice, but it has. Uh, this is our third session or our fourth session. And mashallah, the sisters, you guys are coming with great questions. You brothers are too. You know, uh, we got some brothers uh, with, their, uh, with their questions too. And, I, I, and, and it's just been amazing. Please uh, spread the word about my website. My website's been around since 1986. Most people have heard of it. Been a lot of slander about it, which y'all know ain't true. But alhamdulillah, spread the word. Let them know that we're here for them to learn Islam. If they want to learn Islam in its truthfulness, with the understanding of the companions, Please join my website. For those of you on YouTube, click the bell, hit the subscribe to this channel because I do all our classes live. And I want to remind you guys too, Dr. Dramali. Dr. Dramali does a morning class every morning at 6.45 a.m. See if you guys can join. He's doing... Um, uh, taking verses. They're reading the Quran and he's given the meaning of the verses. This is good for, especially with Ramadan coming up, you get the reward, you know, of learning the Quran, listening to the Quran and its meaning. So Dr. Dramali's class is our first class every day. It's at 6 45 AM. Try to join it. Okay. Then my class is every day at six. We have other classes at nine and do tomorrow we have Dr. Uh, tomorrow's, yeah. Tomorrow we have Dr. Asim. Dr. Asim's class will be at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. He's teaching us how to understand the Quran. Okay. So please, guys, for those of you on YouTube, if you click on the tab that says community, I have been placing uh, the uh, the the uh, schedule up there. So click on that tab that says uh, 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 community and you will see the daily schedule and the times and feel free to join the Zoom room, which is open 24 hours and also spread this Dawa, spread the word, let the Muslims know I'm live, I'm not Memorex, live, bring it in. 
We'll help them get through Ramadan. We'll help them better understand their purpose in life. We'll help them take Islam more seriously. Just give us a chance here. Okay. All right. I'm going to close out here for tonight. I have one more class at 11. I'll be logging in at 11 p.m., which is 30 minutes. We have the Hadith class in 30 minutes, and I'll be logging back in to do that live. All right. So I want to thank everybody for joining and participating in this session of our Ask Sister Layla Live. Supana kala huma wa bihamdika, a shadow on laila hayala anta, a stock fioruka wa atubu e lake.